Hi everyone, welcome back to No Water River and the end of Poetry Month 2013. I am absolutely thrilled today to be interviewing Lee Bennett Hopkins. I think we all know Lee, so an introduction really isn't that necessary. So we're going to jump right into the interview. Now I told Lee when we began um, that there are so many interviews of him floating around the internet that coming up with new questions was quite a, quite a task. So I spread the net a little bit and I asked some uh, fellow Poetry Friday bloggers to contribute some questions and here they are. I'm going to have to jump in of course with the question that I ask all of my poetry guests which is of course uh, just how long have you been a rhyming fool? <laughs> now I don't know if you call me a rhyming fool. <laughs> But uh, poetry came into my life when I began teaching elementary school. Uh, I started my career as a sixth grade teacher in New Jersey. And I found that poetry worked. Um, poems are usually short. Vocabulary is simple. And often I maintain that more can be said about life and love in eight or ten or twelve lines than an entire novel can. And it worked with my students, and I just fell in love with the genre. Did you write poetry yourself as a child, or did you really write your first poem after you had become a teacher? My background was, I came from a very poor family. Uh, I grew up in the projects in Newark, mm. New Jersey. Mm. So survival was more important than reading. <laughs> uh, no, poetry was not part of my life at all. Um, it was when I began teaching, uh, that again, that I discovered the merits of, of using the genre. Uh, but as a child, I mean, again, you know, it was getting through the day in Newark, right. New Jersey. So you weren't going around doing Roses Are Red, Violets Are Blue? No, no, and a lot of that is covered in my book, Ben to Yesterday. Part of this interview, and one of my personal um, areas of interest, is anthologies. And I adore them. I would choose an anthology over just about, a, you know, a single collection of anything. Now, of course, I'm very interested in how one becomes an anthologist. And especially considering that your career, your solo career, shall we say, was going along swimmingly. What made you make that transition to being um, a single artist, shall we say, to an anthologist? You know, what was it about anthologies that drew you and made you want to to go down that road? Doing anthologies are fascinating because you can take the best of the best of the best. Uh, in any poet's single collection, there's wonderful stuff and there's okay stuff. True. I thought mining the best poetry and putting it together, uh, and particularly an anthology with so many different voices, gives it such a rich a rich look. And in most of my anthologies, there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. So that hopefully when a child picks up or an adult picks up a collection, they're reading it as a book, not just a series of isolated poetry. And I think that's the trick, uh, meshing the poetry. Often in a, an anthology, a last line of a poem will reflect the title of the next poem. It's a thing that I've developed that I just find fascinating. So you really study, obviously, uh, I mean, how long does it take you to put one of these together? I mean, because, I mean, if you think about that, making the last line of the poem go into the title of the next poem, you must have to go through a lot of poems <laughs> to make that happen. Yes. For a collection, let's say, of 16 to 18 poems, I may read several thousand, easily. Mm. Um, Depending on the collection, some of my collections are 16 poems, some of my collections are 60 poems. Right. Um, the longer ones, like the series I did with Simon & Schuster, American History, uh, Hand in Hand, My America, America War, uh, those books took me several years to, co to collect. Um, I think My America was in the, in the um, stages for about four years. Uh, again, I'm working on different projects at different times, so that um, it's not focusing totally on one book for four years, 
but I am back and forth on them for that long a time. Um, and I often tell writers, if you're writing a book, you're writing a collection of poems today, 2013, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you won't see this published until at least 2016 or beyond. When a poet when sends you a poem for one of your anthologies, they have to right. know it's going, it might be four or five years down the road, which is even longer exactly. than, tr than a traditionally published book. So exactly, exactly. It's a process. And I'm working on collections now. I have finished collections in production through 2016, which are done. Right. Uh, I'm currently working on a collection now. Uh, I'll finish this year. Uh, the light of that will probably be 2015, 2016. It's a long process. It's a long process. Patience. It's patience. Patience is a virtue. Hmm. Analogies take, you know, yonks to put together. Up until this time, though, you've, you've put together something like a, over 120 anthologies, or has the number risen? How, how, what's that number nowadays? It's about 120. About 120. So, I mean, all together, you've put in like hundreds <laughs> of years on anthologies, you know, <laughs> if you put it all together. I mean, that is dedication. Now, with all of these anthologies that you've done, do you have a particular favorite of your own? No. Uh, it's, it's like asking your, if you have a favorite child. Right, yeah. Uh, each, book, each book comes with a different, a different set of emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go mm -hmm. back to one of my true favorites is a book called Surprises, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. was the first I can read poetry book right and it has wonderful memories because it was done with Charlotte Zalatow who was my brilliant editor at HarperCollins and um, one day we were having lunch in New York and I said to her Charlotte the I can reads have been out since the 1950s when Sendak and Elsa Minerick did Little Bear and there has never been an I can read book of poetry uh, there was I Can Read Mysteries, I Can Read Science. Charlotte literally dropped a fork on the floor in the restaurant and said, oh, my God, do it. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a knockout, an I Can Read book. Mm -hmm. The book took over two years. Uh, each poem in an I Can Read book can only, uh, can only have... Um, 36 characters per line, including right. punctuation marks and spaces. Now, I've done a series of I Can Reads, many. I can't remember how many. Uh, the last one was Dizzy Dinosaurs. Uh, but I can look at any poem now in the English language and tell you <laughs> if it has 16 lines, 36 <laughs> characters. <laughs> and as I go through poems for these books, I'll look at a poem by... Sandberg or a new poet, and I'll say, bye, <laughs> it doesn't fit. Uh, they have to fit to that format for an I Can Read book. Right. So the I Can Read is a very difficult uh, to do in concept. Yeah. But I love it. But Surprises is still in print. Uh, it came out in 1984, and it's in paperback, and it's still a very big seller. Right. Megan Lloyd did the illustrations. Now, are most of yours... In print or out of print, would you say? I wouldn't know. I yeah. forget. <laughs> I'm and always on. I'm always on to tomorrow. Exactly. Unfortunately, all books go out. Not all, but many books go out of print. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame, but of course, it depends on whether they sell well. Yeah, uh, of many factors. Promotion. There are many. Publishing is a business, and I think all writers, including poets, should know that. This is not a game for sissies. <laughs> right. <laughs> so with all of these hundreds of anthologies, or 120 anthologies, by now, do you prefer doing anthologies to doing your own collections? Because, you know, recently you had Mary's Song. I know, I think the next thing that's coming out from you is an anthology, though, right? In yes. 20 In August, which we'll get to later. Um, so you're doing, a, you're doing still both, but which one is there? Do you have a preference now? No, I love doing both. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I love being eclectic, <laughs> to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Yeah. And I don't know, frankly, how I do it or why I do it. Um, 
but I just like to go where I feel the muse wants to take me. It's a strange muse. How does it work? You get an idea, for example, and then you decide, would this work better as an anthology or my own collection? Is that what happens or what, what does that No. Um, writing your own collection is much more difficult I, for me. Uh, I should be doing more of it. Um, I really should be doing a lot more, <laughs> but I get, I love working with poets mm. and in anthology today, as, a, as opposed to yesteryears, yesteryears, publishers wanted anthologies that were by only known poets. Right. So you had to do Sandberg, Frost, Wendell and Brooks years. Uh, the mode today is new, and I am doing a lot of collections with brand new work, mm -hmm. although I have found a method of meshing. Uh, we will we'll get to my new collection in a minute, All the World's a Stage, right. but therein I have poems um, like J. Patrick Lewis coupled with Lewis Carroll. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I have Walt Whitman. Um, with a, a new a new poet, so I'm doing a great deal of meshing, bringing the whole thing together, and it's very exciting. Well, it certainly is really great to hear that people are interested. Publishers, I mean, are interested in anthologies that include new poets, because obviously many of the readers on my blog are not just established poets, but also new poets. Now, you mentioned that you also put new work, new poets in your anthologies, also good news. But where do you find these people? Do you, do you stalk blogs? <laughs> you know, do you just, is it just from recommendations, word of mouth? I mean, how does it all work? All of the above. Mm. I do read a lot of the blogs. I love Poetry Friday. Ah, I'm the Poetry Friday freak. Oh, that's great. Um, I can't wait. I can't wait till Friday. <laughs> uh, I have met new poets via the blogs. Mm -hmm. uh, I do get a lot of recommendations. Uh, poets will say, established poets will say, Lee, would you read by so-and-so, which I do. I do an awful lot of reading mm -hmm. uh, by people who are not published. Uh, and often I find them and it's the first time they've ever been published. Right. I'm currently working on a book that will be pub that will be finished by the time this interview is over uh, for Abrams books. It'll be a board book for babies with 30 poems and they are all brand new, all commissioned by young poets. That is young fantastic. Un and a board you know, book of poetry. Who does that? Of poems. It's a new concept. That's it's amazing. very exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you give us a title? It's going to be a big board book with 30 poems. Yeah, bones. I was going to say, that's, a, that's quite a board book. Can you give us a title or is it still under wraps? Uh, tentative title is Baby. It is a book for children age zero through five. Mm. I mean, are there any board books that are collections of poems? No. You are the first to hear about this book. Ooh. I have not mentioned it before. <laughs> now, with all these projects that you have going on, do you still ever get rejections from publishers or are you of smooth course. sailing? You do. Of mm. course. What writer doesn't? I don't know. <laughs> I was hoping that there would be at least one. <laughs> and they're always wrong. <laughs> and they're always wrong? Every writer gets rejected. It's the right editor at the right time with the right manuscript. I have had projects that have been rejected and a year later, submit the same project to the same editor, and they get very excited about it. Very <laughs> so, sneaky. <laughs> it's sneaky and secretive. Uh, Not anymore. But no, no one is immune to yeah. rejection. Everyone gets rejected. Right. <laughs> it's life. You go. If you believe in a manuscript, I maintain it's better in the mail than on your desk. Yes. And keep sending it out. And I often tell young writers, start with publishers beginning with A and go all the way down the alphabet <laughs> until you hit the right one. Yeah. Along with this whole um, idea of new poets or even, even uh, established poets, 
What would you say is the, the your main criteria for what makes a good children's poem? And by children, I also mean, you know, I don't know about you. I mean, do you include in there up until the teens when we say children's yes, poetry? Yes, goodness. So, and as to yeah. the poems I select, it's simply, <laughs> I call it the ooh factor. Mm -hmm. If I read a poem and I go, oh, then I love it. <laughs> it goes into the book. It has to knock me out. What is it that makes you go, ooh? What is I know it can be ethereal and not you can't put your finger on it, but is there something, you know, is it a craft thing? What is it? Can you give us anything yes. at all? It's crafting. It's craft. And more so, it's honesty and truth. Genuine. The, the writer gets it. Right, right. And again, it is craft, but it is also, as I said, it's an emotion. It's something that that just hits you like a ton of bricks, like Langston Hughes with dreams. It's only eight lines, mm -hmm. and it gives mm -hmm. you enough to think about for the rest of your life. Yeah. When I've, dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. I mean, that's craft. It's honesty. It's tough. And it's poetry. And it's true, mm -hmm. as you said. Yep, yeah, it's truth. I was recently reading a post by on um, on the blog uh, Teaching Authors by April Halpern Wayland, and she was mentioning um, mentors. And she mentioned that she had been mentor mentored by Myra Cohen Livingston. Uh, she, along with a wonderful list of of, of Oh. Fabulous poets. Oh. So I was wondering, you know, is that sort of thing still going on in this day and age? I mean, how important is mentoring for new children's poets? And, and how did that even come about, this mentoring Well, first of all, you mentioned Myra Cohn Livingston. Myra and I were the best of friends. Um, I adored her. We talked on the phone constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, I maintain she is one of the best poets of 20th century America. Not only that, Myra was a scholar. She was passionate about poetry. And after her death, I don't think there's another person in the United States who knew more about poetry than she did. Uh, she was very, very tough but very, very giving when she taught her courses at UCLA that did produce people like Janet Wong, Christine O'Connell, George, April Whalen, uh, Joan Bransfield Graham, on and on and on and on. Uh, Myra was a tough critic and took very little uh, that wasn't good. Uh, we had an incredible relationship. As a matter of fact, I did a memorial, I did took part in a memorial for her uh, in New York at the time she died. And I'm still friendly with her daughter, Jenny. Um, Myra was one who would reach out and mentor people. I think it's very important. There aren't many that do it because they can't. It's time consuming. It's rewarding yet unrewarding. But I have taken people under my wing, and I have started poets on their careers, and they soared. <laughs> and I think it's something that I want to give back to the, po the poetry community. But there are many who don't take the advice. They just don't listen. And they think they know more than you do. Right. No one knows more than I do about poetry. <laughs> and there's no one that has the history, the knowledge. Uh, I have something like 18,000 volumes of poetry in my library, uh, which is probably second best of the Library of Congress. I have been into this field for God knows how long, almost 50 years. I read, I not only read the new, I read the old. I know poetry backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of young people who are writing go into the depth and analyze some of the stuff that's been written. There is brilliant stuff that's out of print. Um, again, Myra Cohn Livingston, Eve Merriam, Carla Cuskin, these were geniuses. And I think that, you know, if you don't know the history, I don't know what, where they're going with a lot of this stuff that's being written today that I think is 
pretty cruddy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yet a lot, you'll get a book that comes along, like uh, Amy Ludwig Vanderwater uh, has a book coming out now. Mm-hmm. Of Forest has a song, which we did work on together. Uh, and I think it's true poetry. It's a beautiful book of poems. Kate Coombs recently did Water Sings Blues that just won my the Lee Bennett Hopkins Pates uh, Penn State Award. Uh, these are young, brand new poets. They've never been published before in a book. Uh, I have published Kate and I published Amy in anthologies long before they did a book of their own poetry. Mm-hmm. So I do believe, you know, it's partly my job to mentor and I think it's important. But there aren't enough of us. But did you yourself have a mentor? No. Mm-hmm. I got it through reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, studying. And if anyone, it was people like the works of Langston Hughes, which, mm-hmm. whom I adore, and Carl Sandburg. And these were poets who spoke to me. They spoke to my... Um, my lower class existence, my poverty childhood. Uh, they addressed hardships, but always with hope. Mm-hmm. And I think I learned a great deal from reading that kind of material. And then progressing and getting to meet, I've interviewed all the major poets in America. Um, meeting and getting to know and love Eve, Miriam, and Carla Cuskin, and Myra, and Aileen Fisher, and David McCord. These were my friends. And knowing them and reading their work brings a whole new dimension. Uh, if just someone just picks up a poem by Myra, they might read it and get a great impact. Knowing Myra gives it more impact. <laughs> I've had an interesting career. These were my best friends. It's, it's sad that so many have passed away, mm-hmm. uh, but also educators like Nancy Larrick, Charlotte Huck. These were dynamic women uh, who were dedicated, who knew what they were doing. Uh, and again, it was a dedication. I don't see that as much as I, mm-hmm. I just don't see it. Not learning, but transporting it, giving back to students, um, imparting their knowledge, they weren't selfish. They were giving. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so important that we all do that. I mean, there's too much me, 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 and not enough reaching out to help others. I think right. it's a very important thing for us to do. One of the questions that one of our Poetry Friday friends asked was, and that was actually was Amy, Amy Vanderwater's question, was your favorite um, out-of-print books, which ones should we absolutely have? Again, unfortunately, all of Myra Khan Livingston's work is out of print. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. David McCord is out of print. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Harry Bain, a marvelous nature poet, is out of print. And if you look at the winners, let's say, of the National Council of Teachers of English Poetry right. Award right. that was established back in the 70s, beginning with David McCord, mm-hmm. uh, McCord, right. Fisher, Cuskin, Merriam, Livingston, uh, uh, on and on, I would, I would definitely start a library start of them. those books. And yeah. they should be part of your, not only your library, part of your learning. Now, a little while ago, we were obviously talking about your life and your Ben to Yesterday's autobiographical poetry book, which I see on the shelf right behind you. Now, that was published in 1995, almost 15 years ago. And still very well in print and mm-hmm. selling well. But my question is, you've done so many books since then and so many things since then. Is there a sequel in the works? Um, there will be no sequel to that book. Okay. <laughs> Sorry whoever asked that question. There's no sequel coming. <laughs> uh, actually, now it would probably be a bestseller. Uh, but I had a turmoil. I mean, my, my teenage years were in turmoil. I came from a single-parent mother, you know, It wasn't an easy growing up, Um, but it was a wonderful childhood in many ways. We learned. We were streetwise. 
Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, yeah. you have the, you know this incredible record for writing and publishing books and poetry and novels, nonfiction. You do it all, and uh-huh. you've won pretty much every award that there is to yeah. win, including That's including crazy. including the Guinness Book of World Records for the most anthologies. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, with yeah. all of those achievements under your belt, is there anything <laughs> at all that you're most yeah. proud of? Actually, I'm proud of them all. It's very exciting. I was very, very proud to be honored with the uh, NCTE Poetry mm-hmm. Award because uh, that's given to a, a poet with an aggregate body of work. Right. And I've been active with, with National Council all my life. I've served on host of committees. I've been very active with the association, and that was a tremendous that was a tremendous honor. Guinness was a total shock. I mean, I didn't know I was... It was all due to Sylvia Vardell. Ah, I was just going to say, now, how, if you didn't know, how, how did that come about? So she nominated you. It was Sylvia Vardell and a doctoral student of hers who initiated this and saw it through. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, it was a thrill and an honor to be to have such a thing, Guinness World Records, my goodness. In all of this, these wonderful things that you've lived and, and have experienced, is there any one thing that you have not been able to achieve that you wanted to? You... No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no. not finished yet, Renee. <laughs> I know you're not finished yet. There was never a disappointment. You've gotten everything you've wanted. I'm working now on, uh, I'm finishing revising a second adult novel. Um, I finished my first adult novel, which my agent is marketing. Uh, that, hopefully, if it gets published, will be a tremendous accomplishment mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. something very different for me. Um, one never knows, you know, it's yeah. the publishing industry. Yeah. Uh, but it's done and it's being marketed and it's thrilling. <laughs> So should that come to fruition, that uh, would be a great achievement. Speaking of awards, this year is the 20th anniversary of the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award, which you obviously established back in 1993. It's not every day that anyone establishes an award for poetry in particular, and you actually got two of them. You also have the IRA Poetry yes. Award, correct? Promise. correct? Yeah, Promising yeah. Poet Award. Now, how did those two things come about and, and why? What made you decide it's time for this poetry award? I was very active with in NCT right. and was on, in the beginning in the 70s when the award was established. It was the first award of its kind in America for poetry. There had never been an award for poetry. Uh, we had the Newbury, 1922, the Caldecott, 1938, never an award for poetry. Uh, it was a very exciting thing to have happen, but again, it was given to an aggregate body of work. Mm-hmm. So one had to be a very established poet in order to win the award. Um, I just thought there's, it's time for another award. And I had approached Pennsylvania and started the, quote, Lee Bennett Hopkins, it's now Penn State University, they administer the award right. for right. a book of poetry. And I thought it was important. It was the first award of its kind in America. It's the only award of its kind in America uh, that is given to a book, not a poet, but a book of poems. Right, right. And comes with a a $1,000 honorarium and a lovely gala at Penn State every year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then down the line being again active in the International Reading Association. I've devoted my life to these organizations. Uh, I thought it would be fine to do another award honoring a promising poet. Uh, This award is given to a poet who has done no more than two books of poetry. Just this week, it was given to Guadalupe uh, Garcia Garcia. McGill for Mm -hmm. Under the Mesquite. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, it's for a poet who has not published more than two books. Uh, I find it wonderful that, you know, it's, again, it's my way of giving back to the poetry right. community that's been so rich for me. Um, there aren't that many awards for poetry in America. The, there are those three and a couple others. There's the Claudia Lewis Award at Banks Free College, 
but there are very few awards for poetry. Right, right. And I think it's a shame. I also think it's a shame that the American Library Association mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. never established an award for poetry, and they won't budge. And it's the only major organization that doesn't have an award for poetry. It shocks me. There, what, what, I was wondering what if they actually have um, voiced a reason for the fact that they don't have a poetry award. No. No reason. One doesn't know why. I have been after them for decades as a, other educators. Mm. I'd like to talk a little bit about your project coming out in August 2013, this year, called All the World's a Stage. Obviously, the title is very exciting to me, not to mention the premise, having been an English teacher, an actress, and a Shakespeare buff. So I'm very curious to know what this is all about. It's, of course, based on Shakespeare's monologue from As You Like It. Mm -hmm. Um, all the world's a stage and all the men and women in it merely players. It is a young adult anthology. I took the seven stages of man as outlined by Shakespeare and put it into seven sections. Each section, beginning with birth, will have three poems. Uh, and it goes through all seven stages from birth, through love, through war, through uh, old age and finally exits because <laughs> we all go from childhood to the end. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, it's a book that's filled with many poems, new poems, um, at coexisting with people like Whitman, Sandberg, other well-known poets, uh, but a lot of new, a lot of new works uh, by new poets. So it's a very exciting book. It's being illustrated by Guy Biu, uh, who has done Atlantic Monthly covers and covers for New Yorker magazine. And he's given a very modern look to, startling modern look, to Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very exciting book. I'm very, very happy it's coming out. I'm looking forward to it. There are about 23 poems. Mm -hmm. Again, especially commissioned by some of our leading people like Rebecca K. Dotlich, K. Coombs is in the book, Great. J. Patrick Lewis. These are all brand new original poems that they wrote for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, X. J. Kennedy. Great. Uh, it's quite a collection. But again, I think the premise is interesting because it brings us from birth. It starts with a brilliant poem by Rebecca K. Dotlich called amazing face, the birth of a child, through to oh. the death of grandmother by Janet Wong. Mm. Uh, so it progresses through the seven stages of life. And who was more brilliant than William Shakespeare? Well, that actually said as a stage production. Oh, it is? Oh, it's being illustrated as a stage production. Oh, now this is interesting to me. Do you think Very that this is something that, that um, actually could be adapted for performance? Absolutely. Yeah. It's being published by Creative Editions, mm -hmm. and um, absolutely it could be done as a performance piece. Because that is vital. I don't know oh, how you feel they, about it, but I feel that the you know poetry out loud is vital. And a collection absolutely. like this that is ready-made to be performed is... I don't know if there's any of those either, are there? You know, a collection I is a collection. Know, but this I don't think really an anthology has ever been performed. Why don't you get on this when the book comes out? I am totally getting on it, Lee. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's a rather remarkable uh, concept, Renee, in that yeah. you're bringing, again, uh, all the emotions of love and war and mm -hmm. young love right through to adulthood and teenage angst. Everything is in this book. Throughout the book, for each stage, like the lover, for example, or the old saws, each stage uh, has dynamic works, and there are only three per stage, but on each part, each new stage, the lines from Shakespeare will be reprinted. Parts of that monologue followed by three poems, and then we go to the next stage. Right. Be a mock perform. I never thought of it. Thank you. Yeah, well, now my wheels are turning. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to show that poetry is timeless. Absolutely. 
Now, Lee, I'm going to end with a request for a rhyming couplet. Didn't you get the memo? I got the memo. I decided rather than a rhyming couplet, I did a haiku. A haiku is good, too. I asked Robin Hood Black for a haiku on the uh, spot, and well, she, she delivered. Isn't she great? Robin, Robin just wrote a poem for a baby for me. Oh, great. I love that I know these people. Can I just say that? I love that I, I, they're all just so warm and generous and fabulous. I love seeing. I love that I know them too. I know, I'm sure you do. You know them better than I do even, but I've just, the best gift that No Water River has given me is getting to know all of these wonderful people. I mean, for me, it's a gift. Every time I add somebody to, to the library, I mean, how lucky, how lucky, how lucky am I? <laughs> <laughs> now, how lucky are we? That, how lucky are we that you do this? Oh, thanks, but really. Uh. Anyways, I asked Lee for a rhyming couplet, as you know that I do, using the word poetry. But Lee has written us a haiku. Go for it. Too many people write poetry, yet so few write true poetry. And there's the button to the interview. <laughs> what else is there to add? <laughs> Lee, I just want to thank you so much for taking all this time out of your, I'm sure, very busy day with all the things that you have going on and enlightening us all uh, as to your process, to the state of poetry, and just uh, sharing your, your generosity with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure, Renee. Keep in touch. Absolutely will. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>